Hey everyone, welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm Michael, I'm with the Vascular Disease Service Line Chair and uh, Eric Yannon is also here as one of the attendees. And today we have uh, Dr. Allison Tan from Thomas Jefferson University and she'll be talking about end-stage renal disease and uh, endovascular AVF. And just so you guys are all aware, if you do have any questions throughout the talk, uh, feel free to leave it in the chat and we'll just kind of address those issues as uh, towards the end. Okay, it's all yours, Dr. Tan. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, everyone. Um, so glad you could make it. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this topic. I've been learning so much myself about dialysis and endo AVF since it was FDA approved in 2018, and I have so much to share with you. So again, ask any questions at any time, and I'll try to address them as we go along. And anything I can answer for you, we'll try to uh, get you an answer at a later date. So let's get started. Let's see here. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, we're going to talk a lot of numbers, data, and talk about procedures today, but I always like to just emphasize that we don't want to lose sight of the fact that behind all of these things, there's a patient. And many patients' lives are dramatically changed when they discover that they need dialysis. So it's important that to remember that our goal in all of this is to work towards improving their life quality and prolonging their lives. So let's talk a little bit about end-stage renal disease. Before end-stage renal disease is chronic kidney disease. You've probably all come across this at some point in your medical training. Um, but there's a not-for-profit organization called the long title is Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, but it's called KDGO, and you'll probably hear it at some point um, in the future. But they put forth a definition for chronic kidney disease of renal dysfunction lasting for greater than three months, and that can be any of these things listed here or multiple things. And the most common comorbidities associated with chronic kidney disease by far are diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So there are five stages of chronic kidney disease. The earliest and most mild is stage one, going up to the most severe, stage five. And each stage is delineated by the range of GFR, that's glomer glomerular filtration rate that the patient has. So note that patients can have stage five kidney disease down here, less than 15% GFR, but still actually not require dialysis. So they can live in this realm for an undetermined period of time um, until they tip over into actually needing dialysis. So initiation of dialysis actually depends on how symptomatic a patient is from their renal dysfunction. And here's a list of potential symptoms that people might experience. And when medical management is no longer controlling symptoms, dialysis is then initiated. So symptoms are typically common, um, commonly seen in a range of GFR from about 5 to 10. The symptoms I've listed here in red are absolute indications for dialysis. Everything else, it really depends a discussion between the nephrologist and the patient as to how symptomatic they are and how disturbing it is to their quality of life. So there's this excellent database that comes out every year. It's called uh, the U.S. Renal Data System, or the U.S. RDS, and that compiles information each year um, from the CD, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and looks at um, renal dysfunction in the United States. So in 2019, the incidence of ESRD, end-stage renal disease, now, incidence, remember, is how many new cases are diagnosed in a time period, so each year. The incidence has actually plateaued since about the 1990s, the late 90s. And if you look at it, it's potentially on the decline. But when you look at the prevalence, and prevalence means how many people are currently living with the disease at this time, the prevalence continues to rise. So why do you think that's happening? If the incidence is stabilizing, why is the prevalence increasing? Well, it turns out we're actually getting better at keeping patients alive longer. So with all the medical treatments we have, dialysis, things like that, patients are living longer lives. And so we have more and more people in the United States living with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. So how are we keeping those patients alive? Well, there's this term called renal replacement therapy. 
And that's just an umbrella term that encapsulates all the modalities available that can replace the function of a person's native kidneys. Most of us are uh, familiar with hemodialysis or blood-based dialysis, but there's actually others that exist. So when a person has end-stage renal disease, they need something to serve to function as their kidneys. So what would be ideal and the most ideal modality of renal replacement therapy is a kidney transplant. So if you look at the different options for renal replacement therapy in the United States, you see that transplant is actually the least common and you know, that's more of a, a demand outpacing supply situation, of course. What we do see, however, is that when we look at all the patients living with end-stage renal disease, people in a younger age group are much more likely to get a kidney transplant than people are older. And that makes sense because we're promoting the survival of the patients who are likely to benefit the most from a transplant. Um, but what's more common is patients needing to go on dialysis. And there are two main modalities for dialysis. Um, and we're gonna start by talking about peritoneal dialysis. And since I have a captive audience, I am gonna spend a little bit of time on peritoneal dialysis because it's uh, well within the interventional radiologist toolbox and it's not something you come across very often. So similar to transplant, although the overall percent is lower, you do see that younger patients are more likely to, be, uh, have, to have renal replacement therapy with peritoneal dialysis than older patients. And unfortunately, compared to the rest of the world, the rates of peritoneal dialysis in the United States are, are abysmally low. So only about 7% of patients needing dialysis in the country are getting peritoneal dialysis at this time, compared to places like Hong Kong, where 80% of the dialysis population is using peritoneal dialysis. Um, Interestingly, given an informed choice, about 50% of patients will opt for peritoneal dialysis. So there's an education discrepancy there. There's also a comfort level with the United States and how we're able to support patients on peritoneal dialysis. So hopefully the numbers in the US will grow over time as we learn more about it and we get more comfortable with it. So what exactly do you need to be a candidate for peritoneal dialysis? Well, you need two things. You need a peritoneal cavity, and you need a stable delivery address in which you can ship the dialysate to. And interesting, dialysate can be shipped to, last I checked, 160 of 195 countries. So if you go on vacation, as long as you plan a little bit in advance, you can have your dialysate shipped there. Just a reminder of the anatomy of the peritoneal cavity. So there's two types of peritoneum. There's visceral peritoneum, which lines the organs inside the belly. And there's parietal peritoneum, which actually lines the body wall. So the peritoneum is uh, comprised of mesial, mesothelial layers, cell, excuse me, cell layer, uh, matrix, and then capillaries. So let's look at how peritoneal dialysis actually works. These capillaries have intercellular gaps and clefts. Um, which are necessary for dialysis exchange. So they're these gaps and clefts are designed to allow particles of different sizes to pass through. And just for comparison, we're talking like in the nanometer uh, measurements versus a red blood cell, which is in the microns, so thousands of times larger. So there are three different methods in which solute exchange occurs in peritoneal dialysis. The first is diffusion. So solutes travel down a concentration ga uh, gradient from an area of higher concentration to one of lower. The second way is through ultrafiltration, um, which is primarily how water exchange occurs. So differences in osmotic pressure cause water to move back and forth between the blood vessels and the diacylate, or excuse me, dialysate. And the third way is a convection, which is just a fancy name for a, like a solvent drag. So as water moves across the membrane, it pulls these other solutes with it and just drags them along. And so it's not dependent of concentration gradients or um, osmotic pressures, anything like that. So let's talk about uh, some of the mechanics behind getting a patient peritoneal dialysis. There are um, 
in order for peritoneal dialysis to work, you have to have some way to get the fluid into the peritoneal cavity. And this is done by placing a catheter into the peritoneal space. So catheters are made in all different shapes and sizes, and none really works any better than the other. Some are just more expensive than the others. But a pretty standard catheter, the one we use at Jefferson is A here, this curl, pigtailed curled catheter. So there's different catheters for different body habituses, shapes, sizes, depending on where you need to bring the catheter out. Sometimes you can bring it all the way up to the chest um, so that the patient's catheter stays clean and that they can access it. And not only are there different types of catheters, but there's different ways of placing catheters. So surgeons place them um, laparoscopically. Uh, interventional radiologists can place these catheters using fluoroscopy and ultrasound guidance. And they can also be placed bedside using ultrasound guidance by interventional nephrologists. So I'll go through some of the basic steps of how to place a peritoneal dialysis catheter, um, per particularly based on how an interventional radiologist places it. And I do these myself. And it's a really great procedure to have in your armamentarium, especially if you're going to have you know, a heavy dialysis practice. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure the catheter onto the patient and locate um, where the catheter is going to come out on the skin. So these catheters, if you can see, have two cuffs in place. If anyone's seen a dialysis, a tunnel dialysis catheter before, you know those only have one cuff. This actually has two, a deeper cuff and a more superficial cuff. So you're going to mark on the skin in advance where you want that catheter to come out. Um, Additionally, you're going to look with ultrasound and locate the rectus abdominis muscle and note, make sure you can see the anatomy where the uh, inferior epigastric artery is running so you can avoid that. Certainly don't want to hit that. Um, but what you're going to be doing is bringing the catheter through the rectus muscle and tracking it along that muscle for a certain length to encourage that catheter to stay in the position that you placed it. So just a little bit of the anatomy, you have the rectus sheath, you have the anterior sheath and the posterior, then you have the transversalis fascia, and then some patients you can really see a thin line of the peritoneum just deep to that. Okay. So the basic steps to placing it, you make an incision on the belly, you dissect down through the subcutaneous fat to the anterior rectus sheath. Once you get there, you make a little cut in it. And you're going to use a needle and pass this needle through the rectus muscle using ultrasound guidance. So this is a special needle. It's called a Hawkins needle. Uh, and this has an outer portion and an inner stylet that twists on. And you can see here there's a sharp pointed stylet and then there's a blunt stylet. So for this procedure, this needle is super important because when you place these in interventional radiology, there's no fluid in the belly like with ascites to protect bowel and things like that from sharper needles. So we use the blunt stylet to track through the rectus muscle and then pop through the peritoneum. And because the needle is blunt, if there's bowel in the way or any other structures, it will push that out of the way. Okay, it just be careful because if a patient's had an abdominal surgery or uh, abdominal inflammation of any kind, peritonitis, there, that can create adhesions and then the bowel won't move out of the way. So I automatically uh, send those patients to a surgeon so that they can have direct visualization of catheter placement. Um, once in the belly, you change the needle out for a wire, you push the tube the, in through a peel away sheath, and then you're going to bring the catheter out under the skin out to a site more lateral. And it's tunneled under the skin and it comes out on the belly. Uh, once the incisions are closed, this is, you put the dressing in place, this is what your catheter looks like. So this is one of those uh, standard pigtail curl catheters. And this part right here is tunneled under the skin. This is about where it enters the rectus muscle. It tracks through the rectus to about here where it enters the peritoneal cavity. This intramuscular portion really helps stabilize the catheter so it doesn't move out of position. Fluid's instilled and then it drains out through the catheter. So once you have the catheter in place, there's the, you know, just the issue of getting the patient dialysis and creating the right prescription for them to help clear their blood um, appropriately. So there are two 
main types of prescriptions for peritoneal dialysis. Um, one is called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, which no machine is needed. And you'll see that fluid is placed into the peritoneal space um, and drained multiple times a day. So there's multiple exchanges. Then there's the second type, which is I think a little more common. Patients don't seem to like to not have to deal with it during the day, but they put fluid in their belly through the day. And then at nighttime, they hook up to this uh, machine that pulls the fluid out and pushes it back in, pulls it out and pushes it back in. So they have multiple exchanges throughout the night. This, each of these prescriptions, peritoneal dialysis is done every day, seven days a week, but they can do it from home. So it's incredibly convenient for them. Okay. So just some complications that can come from uh, or related to peritoneal dialysis catheters. The first three I put here, infection. So infection is by far the most feared complication. Um, infection that's close to the skin surface, more superficial, can be treated uh, pretty easily and you can potentially not have to remove the catheter. But as soon as an infection becomes deeper, and here's an ultrasound image of that, you see one cuff here, another cuff, and fluid, that's this black stuff, uh, around both of those cuffs. So this catheter needs to come out, that's infection, and uh, pretty quickly to avoid massive peritonitis. But there's other complications. Fluid can leak back around the catheter. The catheter can become malpositioned. You can see here how the curl is in the upper abdomen. Um, that's not good. And usually that's a sign that the catheter is twisted around something. In this case, it's probably omentum, just given the location of it on the x-ray um, and cuff extrusion. So the first step to evaluating these, and you'll see this hopefully more and more over time, is to get an abdominal x-ray, see where the catheter is, um, make sure the patient's not constipated, and, and hopefully be able to prolong the, the life of their peritoneal dialysis. Um, so thank you for humoring me about peritoneal dialysis. It's a pretty cool topic, and we just don't see it that much. So let's move on to hemodialysis, which we're all probably much more familiar with and you will become more familiar with over time. So there are multiple ways um, in which you can get hemodialysis. And hemodialysis, as you see, is by far the most common method of renal replacement therapy in the United States. And unlike transplant and peritoneal dialysis, as patients get older, they're actually more likely to be on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, usually as we age, our options and our anatomy changes and our options for other types of therapies decline. So let's start looking at catheter-based hemodialysis. Um, unfortunately, 80% of patients initiate hemodialysis with a catheter in place, and that's a tunnel dialysis catheter or a a non-tonal catheter that goes into the blood vessel at the neck and allows the patient to be hooked up to the machine. Unfortunately, this 80% has remained relatively stable over the past decade. Um, it's a great option because a patient can come in, get their catheter same day and be hooked up to the machine and they can leave it in place and go home with it. And they don't get stuck with needles. Patients, once you get them on a catheter, it can be hard to get them off or they, they may have issue with um, fistulas and grafts in the future. But I say, unfortunately, 80% because um, catheter-based hemodialysis has a really high morbidity and mortality associated with it. So infection is more common, hospitalization is more common, and death is much more common when patients are getting dialysis through a tunneled catheter, like you see here. Um, one issue is that patients tend to be sicker at initiation. They haven't been seeing a nephrologist. Nobody's been following their kidney function. They just show up and they need dialysis. Um, additionally, catheters in place can accelerate vascular injury, narrowing, and prevent them from getting more stable dialysis access in the future. The good news is, is that the orange bars here represent the number of patients on a tunneled catheter. And over two years, that number goes down and fistula use increases. And we'll talk more about fistulas in a minute. Um, so that's great. But you have to be careful because that 
prior graph was just showing you all the patients that were alive at each time point. When you start including patients who are dying, um, you see that you're actually data is looking a little bit better than it really is because you're actually losing patients to death, which increases the percent of uh, fistula use and decreases that of catheter. So there's the Fistula First Breakthrough Initiative, which was a coalition that provided a toolkit in 2006 for people who care for end-stage renal disease patients. And the goal was to encourage people to start using fistulas more, to get patients off of catheters. Um, and they set a, a target of 66% of patients in the U.S. using fistulas for dialysis. And we've done a pretty good job of increasing our fistula use. And the reason for this is because fistulas have the lowest morbidity associated with them, and they seem to function longer than any other type of dialysis access. And that directly translates to um, a longer life for these patients. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at fistulas and grafts. What are they and how are they different? So an AV, that's arteriovenous fistula, is really just when you connect a patient's own artery and vein together. The word fistula just means a connection between two things that aren't normally connected. And when we're talking arteriovenous fistula, we just mean an artery and a vein that are connected. Versus an arteriovenous graft is making that artery and vein connected using synthetic tube, a man-made tube. And grafts have their place too. This is what a graft looks like. So there are two types of synthetic materials used for AV grafts. On the left is PTFE or Teflon, and on the right is Dacron. In for AV fistula and AV graft, sorry, for AV graft use, um, PTFE is much more common, just because it seems to to function a little bit better for that use. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So a lot of times patients don't know if they have a fistula or a graft or, you know, the history is off and we, we just can't be sure the patient can't communicate. So an ultrasound is a quick way of telling us whether it's a fistula or a graft. On the right, you can see this double white line. That's the wall of the graft. And a good comparison with the native vein next to it, which is what a fistula would look like if it were only vein. And you see no perceptible wall. So it's very easy to pop an ultrasound on the patient's arm and tell whether they have a fistula or graft. And just a side note, that's important for when these get clotted because a, a native fistula that's own artery and vein um, needs to be declotted in 24 to 48 hours, whereas a graft can be declotted up to a week to two weeks out. So dialysis access, why are we talking about this? Why isn't uh, just surgical dialysis access the, the standard of care? Why isn't it great? Why isn't it doing what we need it to do? Well, it it is the standard of care and it's it's been what we've been doing for a long time. Um, but there are issues around surgical dialysis access creation. Um, first, it can be very difficult to have enough lead time for patients to plan for hemodialysis access creation. Grafts need at least two weeks to mature for dialysis use and fistulas at least four to six weeks, often longer. So in the United States, 34 to 35% of patients presenting with end-stage renal disease had no pre-renal failure care. So they never saw a nephrologist. Therefore, we couldn't plan for them to get access for when they actually needed it. Additionally, we have um, issues with limited access site availability. Let me find my mouse back again here. Okay. So patients can get fistulas and grafts placed in different locations. So the stars are fistulas. We can place them at the wrist and the upper arm. Um, when we're looking at graft placement, that synthetic tube, we can place those in the upper arm or in the groin, actually. So that seems like a lot of places. So when you look at the total number, that's one, two, three, four, five, six locations to place. Um, and that seems pretty great, right? Well, 
back up one. When you're talking about patients uh, who are older, you're going to note that um, their vessels are not as good as they are when they're younger. Um, additionally, patients who have had a tunneled catheter, and now we've already mentioned that 80% of patients will start dialysis using a catheter. If that catheter has been in place long term, it's going to cause vessel narrowing in the chest, vascular injury, as we've already talked about, and that ruins that entire arm for surgical access creation. So that takes away two out of the six locations already. Um, additionally, patients with poor vasculature are often not candidates for fistula creation at the wrist. Their vessels are just not good quality. So if you take the wrist out on the right side as well, that really just leaves one location in the upper arm for fistula or graft placements. And obviously, we, we really don't like to grow to the groin unless we have to. Complicating this even further is that um, AV fistula maturation rates are pretty dismal. So there's multiple studies out there um, that have reported on the rate of fistula maturation. So a study by Denver, they were actually looking at something completely different. They were looking at the, the effect of Plavix on fistula thrombosis. But then they found that 60% of their fistulas were failing to ever be suitable for dialysis. That means only 40% were actually making it through for use. Um, Woodside found something similar. Um, only about 55% were able to be used within four months. And again, 22% here down in the fistula maturation study failed completely. Um, and another 20 to 30% needed an intervention in order to be able to work. So you have that one site in the upper arm, and then you put a fistula, and you only have a 40% chance of it working, and now you've mucked up the anatomy in the arm, and where do you go from there? So you can see that you very quickly start losing options for dialysis access. So why are failure rates so high? There's a couple hypotheses that maybe as we're pushing for more fistula placement, that our selection criteria is getting less stringent. Um, and that maybe these patients aren't always the best candidates. Um, it's possible also that as our population with of renal failure patients gets older, they have mo more comorbidities, they're sicker, that they're not the most ideal candidates in that regard as well. Um, additionally, there are technical factors surrounding the surgery itself, and that can potentially lead to failure of these fistulas. So let's take a closer look at some of the technical issues. And I do have a couple of videos in here. So this is a patient, uh, Nahel Elias. He's the director of kidney transplant at Mass General. And this is uh, an awesome video he did showing a radiocephalic, that's at the wrist, arteriovenous fistula creation. Okay. So they've isolated the artery in the vein. They cut the vein and they're sewing the vein to the artery. So what are the issues of that? So some of the technical factors that have been discussed around surgical procedures is that as you are isolating that artery and vein to then connect them together, you're disrupting what you call the vasa vasorum. And so vasa vasorum directly means vessels of the vessels. They're little blood vessels that run in the outside of the walls of the blood vessels and supply nutrients and oxygenated blood to these arteries and veins. So if you remember, as you see that it's pretty well skeletonizing these vessels to isolate them for connection. And in doing that, you can disrupt the arteries, the vasovasorum, and cause a degree of ischemia, which is you know lack of oxygen. And that can compromise the healing process, lead to scarring and stenosis. Um, additionally, when you are doing a classic arteriovenous fistula, you have to alter the normal anatomy, and you're bringing either an artery up to a vein or a vein down to an artery, creating um, vessel angulation, tension, turbulence, and flow, which can lead to endothelial damage, um, hyperplasia, stenosis, and uh, poor arteriovenous fistula function. Um, finally, when you suture the artery and vein together, 
what's naturally going to occur is healing and healing occurs by scarring. So scarring causes tissues to shrink down and can lead to stenosis um, and poor fistula function. So that kind of takes us to what we really want to talk about today is what are some of the advancements that we've made um, over the years in terms of hemodialysis access creation, fistula creation. And honestly, there have been none. So <laughs> ever since Brescia Semino described the radiocephalic arteriovenous fistula in 1966, we've used the same technique, the same procedure. We threw a man-made tube in there to do a similar type of procedure. Um, but we just kind of changed the location in which we do it. We do it up the arm, down the arm, but we haven't changed how we do it. So endovenous AVF creation, endo-AVF, percutaneous AVF, they all mean the same thing, is really the first major advancement we've had in hemodialysis access in 50 years. And this efforts to develop new methods of AVF creation were drawn from the observation that traumatic arteriovenous fistula, stab wounds, bullet wounds, things like that, uh, that passed through an artery and vein, they created this natural arteriovenous fistula. And these were actually incredibly durable and either went undetected for a long period of time um, and required surgical correction for closure. They didn't just close up on their own. So um, on the left side of your screen, you see an early stage arteriovenous fistula. I believe this was a stab wound. Um, so you can see opacification of the artery down here. This is the artery going down the arm. And then whoop, you see the vein coming in here and, and lighting up. On the right side of your screen, you see a much older arteriovenous fistula that went undetected for a very long time. Um, and actually the patient developed high output heart failure, which brought this to the attention of the medical team. So you can see that the big puffy thing is actually the vein that's dilated over the years. And this fistula has um, persisted and done quite well over a long period of time. So new percutaneous arteriovenous fistula devices have strived to reproduce the environment that makes these traumatic AVFs so durable. And what is that? No disruption of the normal anatomic course of the vessels or surrounding tissues. Um, no, including no perivascular tissue disruption, and there's no suturing required. Um, although we're not able to change with endo-AVS the issues surrounding absent pre-dialysis care, um, we can address some of the other issues. So if you remember this picture, these devices target an, an almost novel site for fistula creation. So in addition to the sites that we already have for hemodialysis access creation, percutaneous AVF, endo-AVF is done in the forearm, which although there are surgeries that are done in this area, they're not common and they're not really like a staple in the surgical access world. So essentially we're providing ourselves an additional location for uh, fistula creation. This increases the potential number of access sites from four to six for fistulas and six to eight for AV grafts. Uh, this, if you include AV grafts into the calculation. And why we're increasing is because endo-AVF creation doesn't preclude the ability to have surgery at other locations. So this procedure is an addition to surgical options, not instead of, okay? And just adding more access sites for hemodialysis patients does directly results in patients living longer. So for me, this is 100% the most important thing about this technology. Um, so finally, early studies demonstrate comparable but more likely superior patency rates compared to surgical access which again also translates into increased survival. So the longer a patient's access site functions, the longer they're going to live. So let's review the anatomy that allows these devices to work. So I'm gonna go step-by-step step and kind of layer in the arm anatomy. It's not an area that we work very often. 
So we'll start with the brachial artery that runs down the arm. The brachial artery divides into the radial artery towards the thumb, the ulnar artery towards the pinky, and typically the inner osseous artery comes off of the ulnar artery. Alongside each artery runs not only one vein, but two deep veins of the same name. So ulnar artery, ulnar vein. Finally, we're gonna bring in the superficial veins in the arm. Um, you have the basilic vein, which runs on the inside of your arm. And there's this little connection to the cephalic is called the median cubital vein. And then the cephalic vein kind of runs on the top of your bicep and runs down towards the antecubital fossa. Um, the median cubital and cephalic vein join to form the perforating vein. Um, identifying the presence of a perforating vein, the vein that joins the deep radial and ulnar veins with the superficial veins is critical to selecting candidates for endo-AVF creation because not everyone has one. And so why is this vein so important? Well, the endo-AVS, and we'll, I'll show you this a little bit more later, later on, um, no matter what device you use, creates a fistula in the deep, between a deep vein and a deep artery in the arm. Now, when patients get their arm punctured with needles for dialysis, we're actually puncturing the superficial veins. So it's incredibly important that we bring blood from the deep veins in the arm up to the superficial veins to allow these to be accessed for dialysis. So if a patient doesn't have a perforating vein, that blood's not gonna make it up to the surface and it's not gonna make a difference, okay? So this is the job of the perforator. So here's your moment of Zen for today. We'll just watch a beautiful sunset, which a lot of us don't ever get a chance to see. Um, but I, I show you this setting sun because the perforator vein has actually been equated to on ultrasound appearance to that of a setting sun. So I'm gonna show you this clip and this is the cephalic vein here. We're gonna watch this come all the way down the arm. You're gonna see them, it join with the median cubital and then it's gonna set down deep into the arm. So there's the cephalic, joins with the median cubital and here's your perforating vein dropping down into the arm, okay? So both devices, there are two major endo-AVF devices on the market. Both of them require this perforating vein to be present in order for a patient to be a candidate. So let's talk a little bit more about who is a candidate for percutaneous AVF or endo-AVF. So when I see a patient in clinic, I do a thorough history, physical examination, and I actually map them with ultrasound at the same time. This limits the number of trips they need to take. Um, and I'm looking to see if the patient meets uh, any and all of these criteria. So the patient has to have a perforating vein, and we've kind of reminder of where that is. They have to have had no prior upper arm AVF creation or AV graft surgery. I want that anatomy intact and undisturbed. No flow limiting central stenosis. So if they've had a tunneled catheter in place for a long period of time, then I'm going to be very careful about looking for a central stenosis, which could prevent the fistula from developing. So the vessel sites at the, the site of creation for the AVF, and that's gonna be here in the forearm, and I'll show you that a little bit closer later. Those need to be greater than two millimeters to allow enough blood to flow through the fistula for maturation. Additionally, the outflow veins in the arm also need to be about two, two and a half millimeters to ensure that they're going to be able to puff up enough to be accessed for dialysis. Um, the arteries have to be pretty free from arterial calcification, atherosclerosis, which can inhibit the ability of the device to function properly. And typically, the patients have to be a conscious sedation candidate. This is more of a, a relative um, Contraindication, if they're not, there have been some cases that have been done under local, they can be done under regional, um, so that, that's not an absolute contraindication. A lot of the studies that were done used some other exclusion criteria like pregnancy, class three or four heart failure, uh, young age, um, active infection, coagulopathy. So those things are going to give you pause, but there are certain indications and in situations where they may not be absolute contraindications. So I mentioned that there are um, 
oh, I wanted to, this helps me remember to mention that no prior upper arm AVF creation. So um, this is an important point. Because we talked about percutaneous AVF, endo-AVFs being complement to surgery, if a patient is a candidate for a surgical procedure, you want to communicate, if you're an interventional radiologist, communicate with your vascular surgeon. If you're a vascular surgeon, just think about the steps in which you do this procedure. So if a patient gets a procedure up the arm, you can no longer do a procedure down the arm. So if they're a candidate for a radiocephalic fistula at the wrist, you want to do that first because you can never go back. And if they get, even though they don't tend to function as well, but if you get three or four years of life out of a radiocephalic fistula, that's three or four years of life that you just bought the patient. And they can always get an endo-AVF later on. And if that fails, they can get an upper arm fistula graft later on. So things you need to think about and, and discuss in a multidisciplinary setting if necessary. So there are two devices on the market. There's the Wavelink um, endo-AVF system and then Ellipsis. Uh, just a disclaimer, I only have experience with Wavelink, but I you know, read a fair amount about the Ellipsis and hope to eventually bring Ellipsis on board at some point in the future. So we'll start talking about the Ellipsis device. This is what it looks like. Um, it's just a single device and there's the tip and these two are brought together to create the fistula. So there's an animation, it's about a minute long, but I think it's a good um, example of how it works. So a needle is placed through the perforator vein, this, through the skin, through the perforator vein, into the radial artery. A wire is placed, and that needle is changed out for a sheath. Okay, that sheath is placed into the arm, and it goes through the vein, and through and through the vein, and into the artery. So the device, ellipsis device is introduced into the sheath, and this gap then becomes important in just a moment. When you pull back the sheath, you want this gap to straddle the artery and the vein wall, one, on, one part in the vein, one part in the artery. Then that's closed down, and using heat, the artery and vein walls are fused together to create a channel. And then the fistula is created. Okay. So this is a uh, surgeon in Spain who has done a fair number of procedures and you can look them up on YouTube and you can watch him do a procedure. But it's to remind me to tell you that this procedure is completely done under ultrasound guidance. So here's that gap in the device that then it's going to be approximated and closed together to create your fistula. There's no fluoroscopy used here. It's all done under ultrasound guidance. Um, one thing we're, we're not showing you here, um, which has been a later development, is that to decrease the rate of re-intervention, this fistula, the communication, is actually immediately balloon angioplasty to five millimeters after creation. Instead of going back later, they were finding a lot of people had to go back later. So now they do it right after and it improves the patency rate. So let's kind of review the wavelength device. So whereas ellipsis was one needle stick on the arm, wavelength requires two needle sticks because you access both an artery and the vein separately to put the components in and create the fistula. Um, this is a blown up cartoon of the device and we'll see how that looks later. These little squares are cubes are magnets. This is the radio frequency electrode, a ceramic backstop. So options for artery and vein access, there are a couple. So with the, the device used to be a little bit larger than it is now. And now that it's a little bit smaller, you can access a couple of different areas. You can access the brachial artery and vein in the upper arm. You can access the ulnar or radial arteries and veins at the wrist, or you can access one and the other. You can come what we call anti-parallel. 
So the procedure begins by obtaining sheath access to the selected artery and vein using ultrasound guidance. Here in this schematic, we have gotten access to the brachial vein and the brachial artery. These, this is the target creation sites that are options for AV fistula creation. So with the ellipsis device, the last one, the only site you can create, and you can actually see that anatomy here, is the perforator right into the proximal radial artery because you're sticking through and through. But with wavelength, you have the ability to make a fistula in the radial artery and vein or the ulnar artery and vein. And this schematic is actually pretty true to reality in that these ulnar arteries and veins tend to be bigger than the radial artery and veins. But you just have those two options that you don't have with the ellipsis. So here's the actual picture of the device. You see those little magnets in the radio frequency electrode and the ceramic backstop. And this is a cartoon of what it looks like when they're lined up in the, the vessel you want to, for creation. You line them up, the magnets will bring them together. And this is what that looks like when they slide in. You can see this is the vein catheter coming in and seating right into the ceramic backstop. And that's a picture of what it looks like, a little bit more clear. So once you're in position, you're going to, it's less than one second radio frequency pulse. You deploy, um, and you're gonna see a little bit of a jump. And you can see that electrode going across, and I'll play it one more time. That's it. So once you confirm fistula creation, the electrodes are, are removed. You see the arm jump a little bit, and that's just muscle fiber activation. That's not actually related to pain. Um, also with this device, to prevent having to go back, as they saw early on in their studies, you place a coil in one of the deep veins in the arm to help promote blood flow up to those more superficial veins. Um, and as with both devices, this is the type of thing that you're going to see. So you have the blood coming down the artery, passing through your fistula, and out the perforator vein into the superficial veins. Um, on angiography, so you're with ellipsis, you're not going to be re really doing angiography unless you have an issue with it at a later time. But wavelength, you do angiography right after. You see contrast coming down the artery crossing through the fistula and coming out the veins. So usually what they say is if it looks a mess after creation, then you've, you've been successful. Um, what you see after the patient has healed are just two little needle marks on the arm if you've done wavelength or just one little needle mark in the anticube if you've done ellipsis. So this is uh, gross specimens of what the difference is between the two devices. So it's about a five millimeter by one millimeter channel that you create. And with ellipsis, you can see there's a little bit of char. That's that heat fusion, which can lead to scarring. And that's why we balloon angioplasty to five millimeters to help keep that open and from scarring down. With the wavelength device, because you're just creating a slit in the tissues, it actually the body endothelializes that tract, and by 30 days, you have a fully endothelialized tract um, that can be ballooned and, and manipulated as need be. So after the procedure, I usually see the patients back in clinic at two weeks for an ultrasound, and then again at four weeks for an ultrasound. So post-procedure, what I'm looking for is by about four to six weeks, I want to see a vessel diameter, the superficial veins, either cephalic and or basilic, greater than four millimeters in diameter, um, a depth of the vessel less than six millimeters, and that's just to allow the cannulation technologists or the dialysis nurses to be able to feel it. If it's too deep, you can't feel it. And then also to have a flow volume of greater than 400 mils per minute. So ideally greater than 500, but sometimes you can get away with greater than 400. So, that's what my goal. Um, that's my goal for a, a patient for about four to six weeks out after the procedure for wavelength. Ellipsis has seen that some of these patients can be cannulated much earlier on. So even after about two weeks, some patients have been able to be cannulated. 
But at two weeks out, if I'm getting poor flow rates or it doesn't look like it's maturing well, that's usually a good indication that the patient's going to need a procedure, a reintervention, an additional smaller procedure to facilitate growth of the fistula and maturation for dialysis. So um, one of the more common things is that blood is not going out the superficial veins, cephalic or basilic, but it's actually going out some of the deep veins. So to treat that, you actually would just coil the other brachial vein to, again, encourage flow out of the superficial veins. Now, these coils don't occlude the vein further up. The vein can still be used for surgery in the future because you have communications between all the veins in the arm. So they usually stay open and are able to be used. Um, another possibility that I've seen in some of my patients is needing balloon angioplasty, usually of the perforator itself, but sometimes if there's narrowing of the outflow veins, you can uh, dilate those. So this isn't actually an interesting patient. She had a radiocephalic fistula, and during one of her fistulograms, you can see this is the forearm cephalic vein. Here are some of the perforating veins, and yes, there are often more than one. And then the upper arm cephalic vein looks beautiful. So we did an endo AVF for her when her uh, radiocephalic fistula failed, and this is after the procedure. Here's the fistula here. That's what it looks like. You can just start to see these perforators, but here's her cephalic here. It should be there. It's not there. So what this tells me is that there's probably a little valve in the perforator that is blocking flow from exiting out into that cephalic vein. So you can usually disrupt that with a balloon or open that up and encourage maturation. So this would be you know, the ultimate goal after four to six weeks of maturation for a wavelength or potentially even sooner with ellipsis. And I wish they all looked like this. Um, but you can clearly see the superficial veins are dilated and this patient has split outflow between the cephalic vein, the median cubital, and then probably the basilic as well. Most patients will mature uh, their cephalic vein, um, although 16% on average will have split outflow, which is wonderful, you know, for giving options for cannulation. So does this procedure work? I mean, there's been so much buzz around this and, you know, we're talking about this because it, it does work. And I don't want your eyes to gloss over at this chart, but there are, just to show you that there are studies out there, there's studies um, for wavelength and there's studies for ellipsis, still pretty early, still pretty new, but what we are seeing is the technical success rates are really good. The ability to get them to mature at 30 days, uh, excuse me, 90 days, three months, is very good. And patency, that means is the fistula open after a certain period of time? Patency rates are really good. Um, and then the major adverse events rates related to the procedure are very low. Okay. But what's important that we look at is, you know, we're comparing these to surgical fistulas in terms of safety and efficacy in term, are we deploying it? Again, we're not trying to replace surgical fistulas. We want to add it as an addition to surgical fistulas, but we need to prove that this is a safe procedure. So if you compare the numbers, and this is just pulling the wavelength um, cases. Again, I couldn't fit everything on one slide, but technical success for surgical fistulas around 90%. The endo AVF is better. Maturation, 40 to 80%, the endo AVF is better. Uh, median time to maturation is sooner. And the primary patency is at 12 months, although some of these are six months, still pretty good. So it is a very valuable procedure and a, and a good addition to surgical fistulas. Um, additionally, the, the rate of reintervention, the, those extra procedures to help the fistula stay open or to mature, you need less of them with percutaneous AVF than you do with surgery. Um, so there's a, a recent meta-analysis, January 2020, that looked at 300 wavelength and ellipsis patients and actually compared the two devices. You see, again, the technical success, maturation, patency, they're all uh, excellent and comparable to each other in terms of devices. Um, there's a paper by Instant in 2020 that looked at wavelength compared to surgical wrist fistulas, those radiocephalic fistulas. The technical success rate was good. The primary and secondary patency rates were actually a little bit better than surgery itself. 
um, cost comparison, because that's oftentimes what it comes down to when you're trying to convince your hospital to get this device or, you know, trying to get insurance to cover it. How much is it going to cost? Well, a lot, there are a couple of studies that looked at um, cost based on Medicare and Medicaid uh, expenditure, showing that patients with endo AVS actually had uh, about $11,000, $16,000 per year, per patient year lower in the endo AVF patients and with surgical patients. And a lot of this is really due to the rate of reintervention, the need for readmission, the need for OR time, the need for um, procedural costs. So with less reintervention rate, we're seeing less expenditure. Um, additionally, catheter-based dialysis costs were three to four times more than um, functional arteriovenous fistula use. So if these endo AVFs are functioning better for longer, then we're going to see cost savings there as well. Um, and just finally, the last thing I want to comment on is considerations for novel use for this technology. So this is designed for hemodialysis fistula creation, um, but can we use it for other things? And we really can think outside of the box and, and start using this for off-label indications. There's, I know of one pediatric patient who needed more oxygenated blood returned to the heart, who had an endo AVF created that accomplished that without needing surgery. Um, additionally, for patients who have stents in the lower extremities, um, but poor inflow, can we make a fistula to improve the flow through these venous stents to help keep them open? Um, and can we create fistulas to bring more blood down the leg to allow for wound healing. Um, I think these are all things that we're going to see moving down the line. So again, bringing us back to our patients, this is really what it's all about, um, improving their quality of life and um, improving the length of their lives. Um, just some extra references in, in addition to the ones I've listed, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Tan. That was, uh, you made a topic really digestible for all of us. So um, does anyone have any questions? You can put it in the chat box. Well, I, I have a question. So you, you mentioned that the for the ellipsis device, you guys do balloon, an or I guess the, the standard teaching is balloon angioplasty. Do you notice any steel phenomenon after that? So um, there's not as much steel with these forearm fistulas as there are with upper arm fistulas um, mm. because let me just scroll back up to some of this anatomy. So the blood vessels in the upper arm are obviously much larger. So the flow rates are going to be higher. So we tend to see more steel with upper arm fistulas and grafts. Now the ellipsis device that you mentioned specifically. So the flow rates I've noted in their papers have been higher, faster than wavelength devices. So you would expect that these vessels in the forearm, because they're smaller, the flow rates will tend to be a little bit lower, which is great for preventing steel. It's great for preventing um, like high output heart failure, things like that. But um, it can make it a little bit harder to feel the fistula. For the Ellipsis versus wavelength, I think the ellipsis is going to have, you might see a steal a little bit more often with ellipsis because these flow rates are immediately quite high and they will mature. There was one patient who had, I said, a goal of greater than 500 for dialysis, um, and usually my patients just hit that. Um, after an ellipsis procedure, the patient had a flow rate of over 1,000 immediately. So that concerns me a little bit in terms of developing mm -hmm. steel, um, but I think we still need to see more of these procedures to really see how common that's going to be. Interesting. And uh, another question. So, you know, you know I, this is actually a great diagram for it. So it seems like it can flow to both the cephalic and the basilic. And mm -hmm. in the event it does flow mostly to the basilic, yet it's the basilic tends to be a little bit deeper. And what if it's like harder to cannulate? If, is there a way to just shunt everything to the cephalic? So yeah, so now you're starting to get into some of the nuances, which I you know, am learning as I go and I deal with quite a bit. So 
even if you think that cephalic's going to mature, you'd be amazed at how often patients come back and their basilic is just sucked up all the blood flow. Um, oh, some patients okay. have enough of a cannulation length, so you don't need a very long segment. This might actually be enough length of vein, as long as you can feel it, to cannulate for dialysis. And if they have that, then great, you can use the basilic. If they're too deep, you can superficialize the vein, which is just basically like a little bit of liposuction right over the vein, and it's quite that a common thing. <laughs> so I do have one patient that I think is probably going to need that. Um, there's some interesting techniques that we can use. So there's this clamp that they use. It's like plastic, it's 10 bucks, and it just lightly compresses. And typically what they use, use it for is hemostasis after they use remove the needles for dialysis. So they put it on the patient's arm and leave it there until it stops bleeding. But we found that we can, if there's split outflow, but it's a little bit skewed towards the basilic, but we'd rather it go out the cephalic, we can use that clamp for one hour, twice a day to put that on the arm, smush the basilic, encourage flow to then go out the cephalic, and try to train the cephalic vein to become more dominant. And there's been some success with that. So that's a, a pretty cool non-invasive way of encouraging that flow to go to the vein that you want it to go to. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, okay. Yeah, and you know, so I didn't get into too much, but when patients do have split outflow, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of patients with dialysis um, access in their arms, but you see the scarring where they tend to always put the needles, or you see the big aneurysms, the bubbles on their arm is what my patients call them. They don't want the bubbles. Um, so when it's just one vein that they have to use, they tend to stick the same spots over and over, and that can lead to thinning of the vein, aneurysm formation, um, and eventually, rupture. So you get enough thinning that it just ruptures. So if you have split outflow like this situation, it's great because you can, on Monday, you can put two needles in the cephalic. On Tuesday, you can put two in the, I'm sorry, Wednesday, you can put two in the basilic. And on Friday, you can put one in each. So you can start rotating needles and start preserving the skin and the vessels, uh, making it last longer. Interesting. Okay. This Anybody else have any questions? Three so, above yeah, I have another one done. Read, let's see here. It says, FYI, there are questions in the questions tab. Oh, that's interesting. That's lovely. I was looking at, uh, let's see here. I don't even see Are that. you seeing any outflow stenoses develop in your endo AVF patients? Um, it's too early for me to really see them yet. Um, we hopefully won't see at nearly as many because of these lower flow rates. I'm sure it will happen, um, but the thought and the theory is that it will happen less. Okay. And also, um, I, I have a question. So this is all pretty recent, pretty new. And so um, what is the learning curve kind of, how's it like been for you? So there's definitely a curve now in terms of procedural learning. This is all within the realm of an interventional radiologist toolbox, the wavelength at least, because you use fluoroscopy, guide wires, sheath needles, that's all pretty standard. Um, I, I mentioned I hope to eventually bring ellipsis on board. I think it will be a slightly more technically challenging skill set. I think once you get used to it, it will be better. And if your patient selection is good, then it will be easier. But it's completely ultrasound guided. And if you watch the videos um, that he does on, on YouTube, you'll see that he takes the little needle tip and he has to walk it down the perforator vein, shift the course, and puncture the radial artery. So it requires some um, pretty on-point ultrasound skills. Um, but you know the the company training is is a day. <laughs> so wow. they send you out to Houston for a day, and a lot of these things are. But the 
the thing that I've really enjoyed about Wavelength, and I, I suspect Ellipsis probably offers a similar thing, is that they have clinical support that is there for each of my cases. Um, and more eyes are always better when you're dealing doing this. And, and then they also have clinical support for the dialysis centers. So when you saw those two little needle punctures on the arm, when a, a surgical patient goes to the dialysis center, they see the big scar and they know exactly what fistula or graft they're dealing with. Here, they don't see that big scar. They don't know what they're dealing with. So the company BD sends a clinical specialist to the dialysis center to train that center. They know the patient's anatomy, that particular patient's anatomy, and they help guide cannulation until that center is comfortable. And that is huge for success of these fistulas and their use. Have you noticed anything that um, like your practice pattern kind of changed now that you've been using endo AVF? Um, in what way specifically? Is there in, a... like most of these patients are, you know, if we're, we're fixing up their central venous catheter, you know, and then is there like a referral pattern as, as soon as we're, you know, uh, yeah. we place the CVC, we can be like, Hey, you know, actually within three months, we can actually do a percutaneous endo AVF. That, that is excellent. And, and Yes, that should be how you function. Now, certainly you need to know your own environment, your relationship with the vascular surgeons, the nephrologists. Um, we set up a, we already had a very good working relationship with the nephrologists, and so they are very willing to send patients to me, um, and I can then send them to surgery if they need be. But as an interventional radiologist, you are in this kind of gray zone. You know, the nephrologists and the surgeons already have a very happy relationship for the most part. Um, and so you have to kind of not step on any toes, be a team player, and just mm -hmm. really have them buy into it. Now, you may encounter some issues if your vascular surgeons start doing these cases, as many do or are looking to do. Um, but I think, I think the relationship can be there. And just like you said, we do see them for their tunneled catheters. So it's a perfect time to introduce them to it, to give them a pamphlet, give them your card, and encourage them to get in touch with you when the time comes. Awesome. OK, I think uh, anybody else have any questions? Or we're going to say a big thank you to Dr. Tan. Thank you for making this topic really digestible and really breaking down the basics for all of us. Um, I can speak for everybody here that it was great talk and we would love to have you on again. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure and um, you know, happy to, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm trying to do my best. So if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to me there and I'm more than happy to respond. Okay. All right. Thanks for showing up everybody. Thank Good you, night. Dr. Tan. You're welcome. All right. Shout out to UC San Diego. Ha, 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 ha.